So a while ago at an auction I bought a very dirty pallet but that had some really nice HP equipment on it that I was interested in. Uh, it had a whole bunch of 3 kV HP power supplies and an early A to D converter. But in addition to this there was one surprise fellow on the pallet that we had no idea what it was. But it turns out uh, Master Ken reverse engineered it in no time. So what this is, is a, is a 40 kilovolt spark generator to light a xenon lamp for a high intensity lamp. And inside we have, we have some rather simple but interesting circuitry. So let's pause for a second. This thing has to do with xenon lamps. Until the very recent past, it was the best light source for things like cinema projectors, including the ones in the IMAX theaters. Xenon lamps were invented in the 1950s by the German company Osram. What we have here is not the lamp main power supply, but a high voltage sparker necessary to get them started. On the back here you can tell it's made by Siemens for Osram, who actually is the inventor of the Xenon lamp. Um, you, this is the primary transformer. You put 220 volts in and you get 7 kilovolts out, but that's just the start. And the 7 kilovolts goes through this second transformer, um, this circular part here, which goes to the output, and you get 40 kilovolts on your output here, enough to ignite xenon. I, I found this one was used as part of an experiment in spectrofluorescent photometry something. Yeah, at SRI, right, just around the corner, yeah. like, like maybe a few hundred feet from here. So we actually might have gotten their stuff back. So, so a couple interesting features on um, this this big 1000 picofarad 20 kilovolt capacitor bigger than most of your 1000 picofarad capacitors. Um, this thing that looks like Lego is a safety interlock so you don't um, try to run this while it, the case is off. Um, this ceramic piece in the middle is very interesting. It, it's a bunch of um, metal discs with carbon electrodes separated by a very small distance to give you a sequence of spark gaps. Inside it looks kind of like a stack of quarters separated by insulating washers. Spark gaps were used in early radio, we'll come back to that, but is a way to let energy accumulate in a capacitor and suddenly release it in a spark across an air gap when the voltage is higher than the air gap breakdown voltage. The simpler ones are just that, two electrodes with a gap and some fins to cool down the electrodes. But a refinement is the quenched spark gap, in which the gap is made of many smaller gaps, which breakdown voltage is much better controlled and is also much easier to cool. Um, this is what generates the spark that then gets amplified by the secondary coil. Um, the schematic of this, it's basically identical to the schematic of a Tesla coil that you'd find on Wikipedia. So, so this is for cooling, of course, and then you're supposed to take them apart and clean them every now and then. So yeah, it they might need cleaning because it's now covered with my fingerprints that will probably vaporize under 40 kilovolts. <laughs> And can and you show the front face? It has it has good German stuff on it. Yeah, it has all these you know scary German warnings. Oh, it has the of course the Vorsicht. Careful, don't turn this on. And then here in German it says in this zone no metal. So this whole circuit circle here is the high voltage area where you want to stay away from. Oh, this is it's um, European thing. So 220 volt, 50 hertz in. And then that's where you get the, the spark. Yeah, be between these two. Yeah. So I think we should be able to generate good sparks with that thing. What do you think, Ken? What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're risking an electro boom moment. I put this nice copper thing here as the antenna. This is where we think the return is wire. So this is 110 volts, 60 hertz instead of 220 volts. So I don't know if that's going to be enough. Log it in. I'm going at safe distance. 3, 2, 1, 0. Didn't do a thing. Okay, second try with the Radio Shack 110 to 220 transformer, which might not have enough oomph to it. 3, 2, 1, nothing. 
Uh oh, looks like we forgot a jumper across a safety switch, which is the white wire I just added. No cigar. I give it back to Carl and Ken to double check their schematics, and they soon found out what the problem was. Carl found that there's a safety lock inside and the screws were loose so the wires were not making contact. So the safety lock kept any circuitry from, at all from being energized. So, all right. And a one and a two. What, that sure worked? Yeah. <laughs> oh, ho, I think it can do a lot more than a quarter inch. Thanks for repairing it, Ken. So it probably would have worked on 110 if it weren't for the... Nice. Woo! Smells like ozone. Oh, now it does it from the bottom. Do you see it? Yes. I should do this. All right. Oh, electro boom! Okay, this is Marconi radio. So I have now prettified it. Uh, these are styrofoam balls covered with uh, aluminum paper, and it's called the Spitzenspacken Maschine. Achtung, Hochspannung, and then it tells you in pseudo German that you shouldn't put your fingers in it. And under the watchful single eye of my minion, I connect it to the 220 volt. This is normally for my machine tools, but this is handy so it can work at full chooch. Spitzen Sparken Machine, take two. Haha, here we go. Woohoo! Smells like ozone pretty strongly. But what you do with a Spitzenspacken machine when you don't have a xenon lamp? Well, you could do some of the early, you no know, late 1800 radio experiment with the help of this device here, which is a coherer, which is how radio was invented. And it's actually, I didn't know it. It's a, apparently a French invention. It was invented by Mr. Edouard Branly, one of the pioneers in radio, and was perfected by a Marconi, who actually made it uh, useful and made the first radios with it. And it's just two brass electrodes with some metal shavings or filings in the metal. This one happens to be in vacuum, but you actually don't really need the vacuum for it to work. Yeah. And by the way, these fellows are available uh, on eBay. Uh, they're made by a guy called Dave Navoni. And what this little thing does is actually amazing. Uh, so I have it hooked to my own meter and in normal state it has a very high resistance. The uh, little metal filings are slightly oxidized and they don't make good contact at all. So I mean this is over the whatever mega home this thing can measure. But if I give it a little bit of sparks it went down to 3.8 ohms and then it stays. So I have to tap it to restore it to uh, high resistance. Let's try it again. Works every time. 4 ohms. So what happens actually, it has been explained only very recently. They couldn't explain it for the longest time. Uh, but apparently the particle microfuse together through the, la the thin layer of oxide uh, or contamination that's around them and then you kind of unweld them by tapping the thing. And that Ronnie uh, called the radio meter, uh, and radio was for radiation. And first, he was studying how the UV light from the arc was influencing conductivity of materials. He eventually found out that even if he put some kind of shield between the arc and this, it will still work. And eventually he made it across his, his courtyard and said, well, that must be something else. That must be electromagnetic waves. And uh, radio was born. So in the next experiment, we're just going to do like Mr. Branly and put it further away. So it's over here. 
you know, a few meters and see how it goes. And give it a spark. So at a few meters, it's not as good as it was right next to it. Let's, so sometimes you have to find the right orientation. There you go. And I get to 300 ohms. And even more. So it starts to give out the ghost here. But of course what it's missing is an antenna. So here comes my beautiful antenna. It's just a single piece of wire at one end. And on the other end, I just have a banana plug and I'm going to put it to ground. And then I'll put back my little cohere across this. One end is connected to the antenna, the other end is connected to ground. Repeat the same experiment. And see if that works any better. Ready? One, two, three. And bam! I'm down to 20 ohms. And same thing, you have to tap it. And repeat the experiment. Yeah, there you go, works every time. So they found out the uh, antenna held pretty quick actually. Uh, and got to a few tens of meter uh, with the simple arrangement. So the next step is to have it do something useful and not have it connected to a modern ohm meter. So we'll take that thing away. So the difficulty here is that the coherer will work either under the influence of an external electrical source uh, or under the power you give it, you have to stay at quite low voltage so it doesn't uh, self-trigger, which limits me to two volts. But here I have another device that was available in uh, the early 1900s. The relay, if you can focus on it. And this is a relay that's supposed to go in my teletype. And you can tweak it so it's uh, fairly sensitive. And I get, uh, I get it to move with 10 milliamps and 2 volts, which is low enough for my coherent not to get triggered. So let's hook that up. I have now this very complicated circuit where you now I start from the power supply, go into uh, one end of the coil of the relay, come at the other coil of the relay, come the coherer, then it goes into the black wire and goes back to the negative of the power supply. And I've set it at fairly low voltage at two volts so it doesn't uh, trigger the coherer by itself. It needs the uh, radio waves to do it. Now if I do it beans, you can see that I have some currents in my loop. I limited at 10 milliamp. And if I take a closer look, you'll see that the can't actually closes. Right. So let me tap the cohere. Tap and it's released. So it's going to move towards to the left. Uh, this is bipolar relay depending on polarity moves to the right or to the left. So one second. Zap. And you should have seen it move. And tap. It just released. So I have uh, complexified the experiment further and made a proper radio receiver. So I still have my two wires connected to coherer to the relay. On the relay contact, it goes to another power supply, which goes then to power my uh, Russian uh, space celebratory night lamp. And it celebrates the space program. It has Gagarin on it. It has Lenin. Karl Marx is hidden somewhere else. So now the goal is to remote control my Soviet light with some sparks. And a one, and a two, and a three. Ta da! And uh, there's only one problem with it is after you're done, you have to tap the thing to turn it off. So they quickly figured out they, they could uh, have the relay. Uh, contact, make the contact and you know, tap the thing at the same time. So let's redo it again in the dark. 
One, two, three. Here you go. And if you could do that, uh, Mr. Edouard Branly uh, made a demonstration of that, I think in 1900 something, uh, maybe 04 or 03. And he had 5,000 people witness that feat, uh, wireless control of lamps. But let's understand what's exactly happening. So here I put also an antenna, the same, same wire antenna uh, on my scope. And we see what it picks up. Okay, and a one, and a two, and a spark. All right, so it looks like it actually got something. What do we have here? So you can see I have very, very narrow, very short spikes. They are huge. I am at five volts per division out here. So I'm picking up like 40 volts peak to peak. So this is 500 microseconds per division. So very low repetition rate. And then if you look at it, it's a burst of stuff. Let's, uh, let's redo it. There you go, that's high resolution. So you see each one of those spikes gives rise to you no know, very short burst. This is 100 nanosecond per division of complete random oscillation. Look at that. They, they are at all kind of frequencies in there. So what basically that does is it just puts garbage all over the spectrum. And I have my trusty spectrum analyzer here. So let's move the antenna to the spectrum analyzer. Stop frequency, one gigahertz. There you go. So zero gigahertz, one gigahertz. And then look, you can see this noise here is all the uh, broadcast radio. And let's give it a pulse. So it was garbage all over. Let's do a max hold. So, no, unsurprisingly, we have stuff all over the place, it fills out the spectrum. And that's enough to induce a current in the coherer, and that's what we get at the other end. So, because there's so much junk, um, I'm not going to put an antenna on my sparker, but that would be the way to make the range go bigger. And here it is from 0 to 250 megahertz, basically the broadcast band. To max hold. No, I'm minus 10 dBm over a lot of the bands, so that would be bad if I had an antenna on this. Of course, uh, you no know, Marconi quickly got hold of this, and with some others, they refined this principle. Uh, and you no, know, with the simple principle, they got to maybe a, a few kilometers, and then. To get it past that, uh, what they had to do is make this tune, so concentrate all the energy in one peak. And this is easily done by putting an LC circuit at the output of the sparker and put it an LC circuit at the input of the coherer. And then radio was born and pretty soon uh, Marconi was able to transmit over the channel uh, in simple Morse. And that's how radio started was coheres and the spark gap transmitter or our aptly named Spitzenspachenmaschine. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.